Hello, and welcome to episode 57 of the Posecast with Rabbi Shmuel Poser, myself, Seth Hellman. Rabbi, how are we doing today? Baruch Hashem. It's, summer has started in Boston. Well, for today anyway, we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I went to pick up a case of chicken. You know, that's what we do. Half for Shabbos. So the guy who owns it, it's like a, it's a, it's a wholesale place. The guy who owns it is uh, is not Jewish, and he's a very feisty, loud guy. Rah, always, on, always, whatever. He's a nice guy. He likes me, so I'm okay. So, but basically, it's it's in a it's like um, it's past uh, uh, city hospital, Boston city hospital, whatever. It's, it's just like a it's a bunch of places one next to each other. All of them are, are like um, wholesalers. Like it's, there's a dock long dock in front, trucks can pull up. So, and he has his, his little office, and then there's one big freezer, like, you know, the size of a large room. like a, And then there's another one that's that's a refrigerator, refrigerated room, but these are huge rooms, like it's a warehouse. So he's wearing a coat, because he has to run in and out of the freezer and the refrigerator. So I said to him, oh, you must be happy working here today, because it's so hot outside. And he says, no, it's not good. Because I go, I have to go into the refrigerator, then go outside and deliver it. So if you go from 80 degrees to 30 degrees, ah, ah. <laughs> I go, I'm so sorry. I was pretty nice to the guy. Like, oh, you know, it's nice. You're working in a cold place. <laughs> He's like so upset. And so then I remember the Baal Shem Tov teaching, everything you hear or see is less than serving Hashem. And the, you know, the story when, when the, they saw the, the, the going were having some kind of a holiday and they had cut a cross out of the ice and they were carrying it I walking by. And Tal Shem said, well, what kind of lesson can you learn from that? They said, so he said, oh, we don't know. They said, ah, oh. it says, you know, water is like the source of life. You need water to live. But if it gets cold, you can even make a cross out of it, you know, which is. So he said, you have to have passion. You have to have warmth. Then there's life. If not, it could be the opposite of Hashem. So that was Baal Shem Tov's teaching. So I'm thinking like, what's the you know, the idea of, so a couple of things. The first thing is, people want things just to be on a straight line. This is what I'm doing. Uh, but as, as Jews, we have to be able to like, maneuver from one thing to the next thing. There's different types of serving Hashem. There's davening, there's learning Torah. There's all kinds of different things that we do. We have to always be ready to, we have to be, um, easy, easy, easy to maneuver into. Like sometimes you have to do chesed, sometimes kura. Like there's different things. And then, anyway, I thought I was, you know, fast. You're trying to be nice to somebody. Like ah, exactly wrong. Hot and cold, no good. All right, we have a lot of things to talk about today. A lot, a lot of things going on. A lot of things going on. We have graduation this past week. We have today is Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach. And we have Lag Bomer coming up. This is huge, huge stuff going on. Powerful, powerful, powerful. I'm excited. I could use a haircut. Just leave those payas, man. Don't touch the payas. Oh, man. I don't want to see you next week. I want to see good payas over there. All right. I you promise know... it'll be grabbable. Grabbable. Okay. That's what we need. Um, actually, we us Chabad people don't take haircuts on Lag Bomer. We're too busy doing other stuff. It's mm-hmm. too important a day. All right, we're talking about Lag Bomer. Lag Bomer is the 33rd day in the Omer. The time of the Omer is diminished joy because of the passing away of students of Rabbi Akiva because they didn't get, weren't respectful to each other. 24,000 students died. On Lag Bomer, nobody died. It's a time of celebration, number one. Number two, it's an anniversary, the passing of Rabbi Shimon Ben Yechai, who was one of the great uh, members of the Mishne- Mishnaic generation. He also is the author of the Zohar. The most famous story of Rabbi Shimon Yechai was between him, Rabbi Huda ben Gerim, and who was the third one? I don't remember. They were sitting and talking, and one of them said, oh, the Romans are so great because they make these bathhouses and these marketplaces and bridges. Rabbi Huda. Rabbi Huda was quiet, didn't say anything. Rabbi Shimon said, Ah, oh, 
They make bathhouses for their own, you know, pleasure and whatever. They make road uh, bridges to be able to charge taxes. They make marketplaces for for immor- immor- immoral purposes. So Rabbi Huda ben Gerim, who was praise the Romans, he got elevated. Rabbi, Rabbi, the other one who was quiet, he was sent into exile. Rabbi Shimon, they wanted to put to death. So first he ran away and hid in the shul and his, and his daughter or his wife used to bring him food. And then they got worried they'd, ca- they'd catch her and would torture her. So they ran away into the cave, the famous cave of Rabbi Shimon. How long was he in the cave? 12 years. Then the Roman emperor died, and so he was able to come out of the cave. While he was in the cave, Hashem, um, he was provided with a stream of water and a carob tree. And he sat in, in, the, in the sand, and he learned Torah with his son. His son, Rabbi Lazar, was with him the whole time. And they would put on their clothes once in 30 days, and they would daven. When he came out, Rabbi Shimon Yechai was, they, they were walking in this, walking down the, walking around. So people were, were working. They said, what are people, they're, they're crazy. Because they work. You have to learn Tyra. Because that's what he did for 12 years. He was so focused, and, you know, only in, on focusing and learning Tyra. So they would look at people and they would, they would expire. So Hashem says, you came out of the cave to destroy my world. Go back. So they went back another, they went back a whole year. And then Rabbi Shimon said, hey, even if someone who goes to Gehenim, to purgatory, is only a year. We should be able to go out. So they came out and they saw people working. And Rabbi Lazar, his son, look at them. And again, they expired. And Rabbi Shimon looked at them and they, he revived them. So Rabbi Shimon said to him, it's enough for the world, you and I. Meaning to say, is a person meant to be involved in worldly matters? Yes or no? Rabbi Shimon said, no. Rabbi Shimon said, you know, it's not, you and I will be completely, our Torah will be our total occupation. Everybody else can work. In it. Then they saw an old man walking with two bundles of myrtle. This is good smell. They said to him, it was Arab Shabbos. So why, where, what do you have these two bundles for? He said, oh, one is for Zachar and one is for Shammar. One is to remember Shabbos, one is to guard Shabbos. So the two different expressions used in the Ten Commandments. He said, oh, then it's okay. He realized that people's involvement in the world was not for selfish reason, but to serve Hashem. Okay, so that's, that's the other thing. Rabbi Shimon Yechai um, passed away on Lagba Emer, and he said that on his day of passing, it's not a sad thing. It's like bonding with Hashem. Now my soul is leaving this world, bond with Hashem. So an absolute tzaddik can say that. I've done my mission in this world, now my soul goes back to Hashem. It's time to celebrate. Everybody should celebrate. And to the degree that there was one man who used to mourn the Beis Amigdash, saying the special praise we say in Amida on Tisha B'Av, he would say it every single day of the year. Shabbos, Yont, of any other time. But when he said it on Lag Ba'imer, something happened to him. It wasn't a good thing. Because he wasn't respecting the, the, the holiday of, of which means that Rabshim Yichai was not only was he, he was in such a high level, it says that for him the base Midrash wasn't destroyed. He was in such a state of connection to Hashem, it's like he had the base Amigdash. So this is a very happy day, and it's especially connected with children. The pure children, you know, the voice of children were entire and Avin. And so by the Rebbe, they would have on Sundays. When it started out back way back early in the when the Rebbe became Rebbe, they started having a parade. But if you look at pictures of parade, then they would walk like on the um, right in front of seven seventy is, is a service lane, and then there's a little island. And they would, you know, you see a line of children walking with with signs, keep Shabbos holy, things like that. And the Rebbe would come out seven seventy with in front of seven seventy made a little pra- a platform, and the Rebbe spoke to them. And then there was. I don't know, about it, probably, I don't know exactly, probably about 10, a dozen years that there was a Lag Bomer parade and made a huge stage and was a, thousands of kids would, would, would come and the, the, whole, the whole, whole Eastern Park was, is shut down and um, kids from all over New York and even outside New York would come to the parade and would make floats on, on you know, flatbed trucks, all with themes about Shabbos or 
Yontif or Mashiach or learning Torah, all these, and, and these would drive by on the service lane in front of 770, like there was a, a, a big stage, like a reviewing stand, where the Rebbe would stand there and, and, and wave to the children, and there would be music, and it was a very, and then the kids would, walk, and all the children would walk by the Rebbe as well, and go a few blocks away to some park, they have like all kinds of amusement rides and stuff like that. It's a big deal. But that is, that's that been the custom in, in, in amongst Jews that you take children out to a park. Some some people have a custom to use bows and arrow. Bow and arrows. What's a bow and arrow? Because in Hebrew, it's called keshes. Keshes means a bow. So in, in, in the Torah, it talks about the rainbow. It says kashti, my bow. So... On the, it says, because Rabbi Shem Yechai was such a powerful holy Jew, in his generation, there's no rainbow. Rainbow is a reminder. So Hashem is saying, I would bring a flood, but I'm not going to because this is my sign that I'm not going to bring a flood. So in the times of Rabbi Shem Yechai, never saw the rainbow. Now, so, that, so some people, some kids have like, you know, toy bow and arrow. Now, what's the idea of the bow? When you take the arrow, you pull the arrow back towards you. Then further back it goes, and then let go, it goes farther away. And that's the idea of Shimon Yechai, who, who, who um, wrote the Zohar, which is the Jewish mysticism, right? It, it goes deeper. So the deeper you go into yourself, the farther it projects you out into the world in a successful way. So those are something. So the thing over here is like this, guys. Everybody has to go to a Lag Bomer celebration. That's this Sunday. Your Chabad house near you is doing something, hopefully for children. It could be maybe it's a eat meat, lots of meat. Why meat? Barbecue. Because it's just barbecue. Yeah. Okay, barbecue is is a, maybe a Monday to barbecue, but you can make you have oh, oh bonfires, bonfires, of course, mm -hmm. fire. So yeah, you make bonfires. Fire, you know that's another. That's definitely a log bomb or a custom. That's the night before, the first night. They'll be after Shabbos, Saturday night. Make the bonfire during the day. Bonfires, you know, don't help much. But during the day, go out to, into the field. What it says that the Reb Marash would go into the field, would drink. He would have a, like a lachaim. And many miracles were seen by the Rebbe. This was known. Every new log bomb was a time, a special time. By Rajbi and by and by any great Sadiq, especially by the Rebbe, lessons for children. Lessons for children. People would, would like the Rebbe would come to se leave his house, come to 770, then he would go to the mikvah because he would go to the oil afterwards. People, people would stand outside the house, outside of his door. Parents, oh my parents, men or women that were looking for wanted a blessing for children would stand and 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 yeah, and many people were blessed with children, and it happened, it worked. So Lag Bomer is a very powerful day, even though the only thing that we, technically, that we on Lag Bomer, we don't say Tachlon. But other than that, it's a regular work day. Um, and of course, we can listen to music, the restrictions of of, the, of counting the Omer when we're a bit, bit sad or taken down. But it's not a Torah holiday, but it's a very deep custom. And as Rebbe always say, quote, Minig Yisrael Tairi, that a custom amongst Jews is also part of Torah, and so therefore it has relevance. We don't just, you know, just don't, you know, throw it away. So that's very important. Lag Bomer Sunday, make sure you are together with other Jews, celebrating, especially children, and um, it brings a lot, and celebrating on, in honor of Rabbi Shimon Yechai, and also the other theme, of course, is Avas Yisrael, because the, the as soon as Rabbi Kiva died, because they didn't respect each other, which is the lack of Avas Yisrael, caring for another Jew. So getting together at these celebrations honors Rabbi Shimon Yechai and shows care for one, Jews for one another. And especially now that we need blessings for the Jewish people around the world, Avas Yisrael is a great, great way to do it. Hang out with other Jews, be nice to each other, and uh, Hashem will bring blessings. That's Lag Bomer on Sunday. But here it's t today is today. And today is Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach. What's the second Pesach? So the Torah tells us that the first year the Jews left Egypt, so there's the first year after the Jews left Egypt, Shem told Moshe the Jewish people should make a carbon Pesach, bring the Pesach sacrifice. 
Now, in fact, that was the only time they did it in the desert because they weren't able to circumcise themselves in the desert. And you have to, that's one of the requirements for the Pes- to, to bring the Pesach sacrifice to be circumcised. So they didn't bring a Karm Pesach all the 39 years they were in the desert, except for the first year when they came out. And there were some Jews that became Tame. They came in contact with the dead body and they couldn't do the, bring the Karm Pesach in its time. They said to Moshe, why should we miss out? What did we do wrong? You want to have it? So Moshe says, oh, wait, I'll ask Hashem. Hashem said that those that weren't able to bring the first Karm Pesach can do it a month later. And that's Pesach Sheni. So today, we didn't bring the first Karm Pesach, we can't bring the second Karm Pesach because there's no Beis Amigdash. But the message is very powerful. What's the message? Now let's put up the Rebbe's letter there and we'll see what the message is. This was sent to me by a friend today, a letter that was written in 1951. And you'll notice the stationery is on top of the stationery, it says the Rebbe's name, and it's like typed out. The, 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 uh, it's, not like, it's not like, yeah, that's good, leave it like that. Like the top is Lubavitch, it's not the official stationery. This is because this is year of 57, or it's already a year later. I don't know why they didn't get proper stationery. But anyway, okay, it's a year, it's a, over a year after the Rebbe became Rebbe. But it's, and you look at the phone number, it's very interesting. Hyacinth 39250. Back in the day, they had letters. Anyway, it's, uh, okay, so the letter. Blessing and greeting, I was pleased with the opportunity to exchange a few words with you as, as you con- connected your visit with the day of Pesach Sheni, which we observed on the day before yesterday. I wanted to make, make it the subject of this letter. Because it's the 16th of year, Pesach Sheni is the 14th of year. One of the significant lessons of Pesach Sheni is never to despair even when one has not attained the spiritual heights of others. Thus, while all the people are celebrating the Passover in its proper time, and one finds himself, quote, far away, which is what the Pasuk says, or otherwise unfit to enter the sanctuary, the Rebbe doesn't, I, I assume the Rebbe doesn't want to mention that the use the word unpure or tame, so he just says, he quotes the other part of the Pasuk, far away or otherwise unfit to enter the sanctuary. He is told, do not despair. Begin your way towards the sanctuary. Come closer and closer, for you have a special chance and opportunity to celebrate the second Passover if you try hard enough. Please pay my guards and messages to your circle cordially. I don't know who this is addressed to. I just know the person sent it to me. And just... So what the Rebbe is saying over here is, even if you're far away, which means in distance you're far away, but also means spiritually if you're far away, you can always come closer, you can come back. If you try hard enough. What does that mean, try hard enough? Because what's unique about Pesach Sheni, which doesn't happen any other time in the Torah, that the Jews come, like who are, every other mitzvah, Hashem comes and tells Moshe, tell the Jewish people, keep Pesach, keep Sukkot, all of a sudden, Pesach, Hashem could have told them, if you missed the first Pesach, you do the second one. But no! Hashem doesn't tell them. So how are they supposed to, how, do, how are they supposed to, how does it come about? It comes about from the Jews wanting to do it. Not from Hashem. It was, it was initiated by the Jewish people. And that's the power of Pesach Sheni, that we should initiate what Hashem wants from us. And it teaches us another thing which is very, very powerful. And that is, Pesach itself is such a powerful holiday. We talk about the idea of Pesach is getting free from constraints out of out of slavery, Hashem chose us as his people. Once we live through Pesach, if you do it the right way, it's like really you're supposed to expand your parameters of how you serve Hashem. Comes a month later and says, no, not good enough. You got to do even more. Always higher and higher and higher. So even though Pesach Sheni, like Timot Lag Bomer, doesn't really have any actual, what well, customary is that we eat matzah today? If you haven't eaten matzah, you can eat it today. Oh, it's up there. There it is. <laughs> I think I still have a piece or two left. Oh, good. Actually, there's, there's a question when to eat it because the 14th of, of um, year is when you when the, when they would bring the sacrifice. But just like the first Pesach, you eat it at night. Mm. So some people eat it in the morning, some people in the afternoon, and some people eat it at night. I think there everyone said, ah, all three times eat it. <laughs> Eat a lot of matzah if you have any left. Anyway, so that's the only thing we do. But the, so, the, so the practical celebration of Pesach Sheni is symbolically eating matzah. But the message is a powerful, powerful message. 
that we can ask of Hashem. Almost, and in a way, when you point, when Moshe could have said to him, like, guys, you know the rules. If you're Tame, you can't do it. And not only that, if you're Tame, it's okay. You know, it wasn't your fault. Let's say, for example, and the Rebbe even talked about this, says, if, let's say, a close relative, God forbid, passes away, do you have to go to the funeral? The Torah says you have to. In two weeks ago, we, we learned the parsha of Emmer the, with, the, with the laws to the Kayanim. And it says to the Kayanim, it says to the Kayanim that you can't become Tame, except for your father and mother. And a Kayan Gadol can only come Tame for a, 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 in a certain, very certain circumstance. But he also. If, if he comes upon a, a person who has nobody else to bury him, he has to bury them. So the Koyen Gol, the high priest, must become Tame. And if it, come, it happens a couple of days before Pesach, he won't bring you up to be the current Pesach. So it's embedded in the Torah that you could become Tame before Pesach and not bring the current Pesach. The fact that this happened to these people is like, okay, it happened. You, you're not bad people. You didn't do anything wrong. Nonetheless, they insisted we want to bring the Karm Pesach because the Karm Pesach is such a foundational part of who we are as Jewish people. It's the first mitzvah that Hashem commanded all the Jews to do, to bring a Karm Pesach. And that represents breaking ties with the idol worship of Egypt. Like, hey, so we don't want to be, we don't want to be left out of that. We want to be part of that. And so therefore, Hashem, and that, and that makes the request of the Jewish people, so powerful, coming to Moshe and saying, Lam li gara, why should we be left out? And Hashem says, okay, you know what? It's your, you, can, you can bring the Karm Pesach in the second month. Now, the difference in the first month of Nisan and the second month, Iyar, is interesting too, because Nisan is when Pesach happens. When Pesach happens, it's all miracles from Hashem. The month of Iyar is unique in the mitzvah that we count the Omer every single day. Counting the Omer is about us trying to refine ourselves and get closer to Hashem and get ready to receive the Torah. And also, if you think about it, Nisan is, in the Torah is considered to be the first month. When Hashem takes the Jews out of Mitzrayim, He says to Moshe, this month will be the first month for you. In counting months. So in the Torah months, the, Rosh Hashanah, according to the Torah counting of months, not of years, is the seventh month. Starting from Nisan, when Pesach happens, is the first month. So the first month versus the second month. The first month is like you, total unity with Hashem. The second month is there's, there's an other that has to be dealt with. And when Hashem reveals himself to the Jews in Mitzrayim, it's all Hashem. The second month is like, okay, we exist and we have to refine ourselves and, and, and improve our relationship to Hashem. So that's ear. Another thing about this, the first Pesach is you have to, you know, you have to clean the Chametz, Right, the whole thing. Second Pesach, you're not allowed to eat with. Yet, if you actually brought the, sec, the, the Pesach sacrifice in the second Pesach, you wouldn't allow to eat it. You had to bring it in the base of Mikdash, then eat it. But you couldn't eat it with chametz. But chametz could be in your house, which means, like we spoke a couple weeks ago, that eating chametz is not bad if you do it right because you want to elevate it. So the first Pesach, no chametz around, only matzah. The second Pesach, you're supposed to already have integrated the lesson of the first Pesach into your into your life. Now I can eat the second Karm Pesach if, if I didn't get the first one, but I can have chametz in my house already also. So that's like a step up. We want to engage the world, make the world holy, not separate ourselves from the world. And by the way, another thing, because I was, I was listening to a Fabring of the Rebbe today. I was busy doing stuff with my hands, so my mind was free. So I listened to a Fabring of the Rebbe of 1983, which is fascinating. I'm going to, tell you, I'm going to say something here. Some of you might know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to say, you know, there's confessional prayers that we say. And when it's a holiday, we don't say them. Shabbos, Yont, we don't say them. And sometimes a weekday when it's a, let's say there's a bris happening in the shul, you omit that section of the prayer. It's a small section, we omit it. And also at night, and at Mincha you do it also, and at night before you go to sleep, there's a bedtime Shema. It's not just the Shema, there's other prayers too, and also the confessional prayer, right? Before you go to sleep, you want to cleanse yourself and go to, you know, make good with Hashem and go to sleep. Your Neshama goes up to heaven. 
gets refreshed, comes down, start a new day. But on days of celebration, you don't say Tachlan at night either. Now, but the question is, confessional prayers is a way of part of the tshuva process. Part of the tshuva is you have to enunciate the sins. Now, if you don't say this, how do you get forgiven? So the Rebbe says, oh, of course, you know, it's not, you're losing, not losing out on something, but it's happening through joy, like Shabbos. Shabbos, the word Shabbos itself is, has the same letters as Tashiv, which means to return, which is tshuva, reconnecting. But it doesn't happen through confession. It happens through positive, through joy. Ah! So on Shabbos, so the joy of Lag Boimer, the joy of Pesach Sheni, when you don't say Tachlan, that also elevates you and brings you to a state of connection to Hashem. So the question is, so the, we know that in Judaism, night always precedes the day, right? Friday night, then Shabbos. But there's an exception by a carbon. I don't know if you learned this in your Daf Yemi yet, but by a carbon, you're allowed to eat the car, you bring the carbon by day. And you could eat it that day and the night, like the Karim Pesach. You bring the Karim Pesach by day, you eat it at night. So you see that like sacrifices, the night follows the day. Last night, I didn't do anything, so nothing happened. Today, I brought a carbon, so the night now also gets connected. And when a person brought a carbon, a personal carbon, it was a holiday for them. So the holiday starts by day when you bring the carbon and continues into the night. So Sturbe said, why is it like that? He says like this, the word oilam, world, is connected to the word helam, concealment. So normally, what comes first? How is the world created? Vahi erev, vahi baiker. It was evening, it was day, the first day. And that's the whole six days of creation is like that. Seven days of creation. Because in the world, what comes first? What do you see right away? You see darkness, you see concealment. Then you have to dig deeper and say, ah, that's really Hashem's world. So when you talk about things that are normal days, the night comes first. When it comes to the Beis Amigdash, where you bring sacrifices, there you walk in. What's what's the what what's in the world? What's obvious? The concealment. What's not so obvious? Godliness. In the Beis Amigdash, what's obvious? Hashem. What's not obvious is the concealment. So when you come to the Beis Amigdash, the day comes first. And then comes the night afterwards. And so now, the, now we're going to go back to Tachman. I know it's a little complicated here, but I hope everybody's holding it. You go to Tachman. So Friday night, you don't say Tachman. It's Shabbos. Shabbos by day, no confessional prayers. What's about Saturday night? The bedtime Shema. Do you say Tachman or not? Do you have the confessional prayers? The answer is, what do you say? Ask the question again. <laughs> Saturday night, confessional yeah. prayers or no, confe- no confessional prayers? No. Because nice what hap- what's the meal you eat after Shabbos? Malava Malka. You're accompanying the queen. So sh- after Shabbos, in fact, the the, the, the in says you should wear your Shabbos clothes after Shabbos. You don't change right after. It's, you know, people like they throw because it still carries the aura of Shabbos. What's about Rosh Chodesh? The night of Rosh Chodesh. You don't say Tachman. The night after a Chodesh, it's like, it's over. It's ready the second day. Like if you count the Omer, so Rosh Chodesh year, for example, was um, whatever day of the Omer was, but that night is ready the beginning of the next night of the Omer. So you don't, so when it comes to Pesach Sheni, should we say Tachman tonight? The answer is no. Why? Because when did they eat the Karm Pesach? At night, they, they sacrificed it today and during the daytime and ate it at night. The Rebbe said he never saw anybody write anything about it. He, said, he didn't find anybody, but I don't, I'm a, and I haven't seen anything written about it either. But my assumption is the way the Rebbe explained it, it makes so much sense, it's so logical that tonight for sure it's, it's an extension of Pesach Shani because, and that's why some people have the custom of being matzah tonight. Anyway. That's a little about Pesach Shani. The idea that it's never too late. Never give up. If you, even if you, whatever you've done, even if you come to state of, you're not allowed to walk into the Beis Amigdash because you're a state of impurity. You can come to Hashem and say, we want to go. We want to be there. And that's, and so that's, that's, I think, the message that we have to carry with ourselves. So just to wrap this up, we must, must, must celebrate Black Bomber. Take your children. Anybody who's listening has children. 
And it's a day of Jewish pride. Talk about Jewish pride. This is it. This is be outdoors and don't dress your, your children in Bruins uniforms or Why not? red wings. <laughs> They've got kosher food at the TD Garden. There's kosher food there. Mag Bomber, no TD Garden. Mag Bomber is totally holy. Go to the field and get lessons from Hashem and take your children there and teach them. And, and the Rebbe says, even they would take children out of school, not learning Torah, to celebrate this very special day. And um, Pesach Sheni insists that the world get better, insists that Hashem brings us purity, holiness, Mashiach now. Amen. And with that, Thank you so much for listening to episode 57 of the podcast, Rabbi Shmuel Posner. We will see you next week.